Hey everybody, welcome to episode 67 of the Hoopercast. This episode is just me and Dustin um, talking about some shows we've been keeping up with. Um, so I'll put the time code in so you can skip to the shows that you are interested in. So yeah, anyway, just uh, enjoy the episode and uh, stay tuned for future ones. Thanks. Hey everybody, welcome to the Hoopercast. Um, I'm Hooper, and who's this on the other end of Skype? This would be Dustin. Oh my god, it's Dustin! I didn't expect that. Oh my gosh. Whoa. Uh, oh. Okay, so we've got some TV to talk about today. Um, Dustin, do. you've got a couple of shows you had something to say about. I've got some stuff too, but let's start with you. Start with me, okay. Because I'm polite. Um, ju- oh, okay. Just gentleman. to warn you, I have a delicious pizza in front of me right now. So any smacking or overall chewing noises are attributed to my lunchtime activities. It's bad radio, so, Dustin. I'm sorry. I've I'm, got some. I'm, I apologize. Throat warming coffee here too, so don't mind my sipping. That was loud. I will give you that. I'm going to have to see how that sounds I, later. <laughs> I, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I held it right up to the mic. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I just thought I'd talk about two shows that I've been watching recently. Um, we've got The Flash and Arrow. The Flash started in 2014, the fall season, and Arrow started, I believe, in 2012. And um, I had always had no interest in Arrow because I had suffered through Smallville for 10 years. And um, I say suffered through it. Well, okay. The first few years were okay. And then beyond that, it was really garbage. And I didn't actually watch the last two seasons. So eight years, 10 years total. I didn't watch the whole thing. Anyway, Mm -hmm. point is um, I had suffered through that. So I was just like, okay, I don't want to deal with another, you know, CW show where things are super Abercrombie models doing crazy things. Flash forward to The Flash. Um, The Flash is a character that I really love. And so, of course, when it is announced, I'm excited for it, even though it's a CW show, even though I know it's going to be kind of garbage. I decide, okay, I'm going to watch this and I'm going to give it a, a try. So it comes out. Then a week or two later, I check it out on Hulu. And I was actually really very surprised. And and I think maybe we talked about it a little bit on on the Hoopercast before. But The Flash is actually a really, really interesting show. It has some solid characters um, that are intriguing and likable and funny. And overall, you know, I felt like it captured the the spirit of the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man film, which is to say that it wasn't a dark, brooding kind of movie. It was... You know, The Flash is a funny, likable, charming, you know, young character. So it had that that Spider-Man sensibility to it. And then when you think back to the first Sam Raimi movie, uh, there's a little bit of narration that opened and closed the movie. You know, who am I? I'm Spider-Man kind of thing. Uh, The Flash borrows a little bit of that, has some opening and closing narration from Barry Allen. Um, And so... Overall, it just kind of reminded me a little bit of Spider-Man, and so I enjoyed it for that reason. Creatively, I mean, it is still a CW show, so sometimes it looks a little cheesy. Sometimes it looks a little, you know, television, if that makes any sense. By and large, I mean, these actors are actually really well-suited for the roles that they're playing. Grant Gustin plays Barry Allen, and I've never seen him in anything. And and honestly, you know, if he was a newcomer, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. But he really is the best thing about the show. He is funny and has a good comedic sensibility about him. And on top of that, also can display that heroism that The Flash is growing into uh, over the first uh, half of this first season, which is all that has aired up to the recording of this episode. It, it was It's just a fun show, and, and, and Grant Gustin can play this character well. 
uh, for all of his um, ups and downs. And he does have a lot because um, I'll just recap a little bit of the, the premise here. The premise is that um, when Barry Allen was a young boy, I believe eight, ten years old, something like that, because things always happen to superheroes when they're eight or ten, um, <laughs> his mother was killed um, in his home. Barry wakes up, goes downstairs, and there's a, a ball of lightning around his mother. Um, it looks vaguely humanoid, this lightning. And um, Barry tries to reach out for his mother, but in an instant is out on the street. Um, and when he comes back into his home, his mother has been stabbed and is dead. And the police arrive and arrest his father for the murder. And his father is played by the original, TV's original Flash, um, John Wesley Shipp huh. um, from the 90s show, which is a really, really cool nod. And he's not the only cast member from the original show that is in this one. Um, in fact, Mark Hamill will make an appearance in the second half of this season uh, as the trickster, which uh, was a role he played in the original 90s um, Flash series. Wow. Um, so they're going all out with this. So Barry grows up, becomes a CSI, uh, inspired, of course, by his mother and by the belief that it wasn't his father who killed her, but rather this ball of lightning. So he begins to study the paranormal, begins to study you know strange things that have been happening, and uh, as chance would have it, um, a local science laboratory, Star Labs, is um, developing a particle accelerator, and when it goes haywire, the shockwave from that event uh, coupled with a lightning strike gives Barry super speed. So now Barry is a ball of lightning and begins to kind of think that maybe this ball of lightning that killed his mother was another speedster like himself. So of course now he's very motivated to find who the speedster is um, and um, and whatnot. And, and um, Barry's a good, good, kind-hearted guy, and so he begins to use his powers for good. They, they don't really waste any time with this, you know, I could use it for personal gain or I could use it for anything other than, you know what, it's the right thing to do. So that's kind of a welcome change uh, from typical superhero kind of things. And um, So anyway, the point is um, the Flash begins to patrol Central City, and long story short, you know, it, it feels a little bit like Smallville did in its early seasons. You know, Smallville had what they called the freak of the week. It was a random person with random superpowers that Clark would have to go up against. And this is a little bit of the same, but the difference here is that the villains that the Flash, that Barry is fighting, they're actually villains from the comics. Like I said, the trickster. We've already seen Captain Cold played by a Prison Break's Wentworth Miller. We've also seen a version of the Weather Wizard. We've actually seen Gorilla Grodd, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, We've seen Plastique, we've seen General Eiling, and um, many more. And um, these villains are all, um, we've actually also been hinted at, um, uh, they've hinted at Heatwave. So there's there's a lot of big things in the works for this show, and a lot of classic Flash villains that will be uh, introduced shortly, if they haven't already been. And um, yeah, it's just a really solid show, and it, it to me... It may be the best superhero show live action that I've ever seen. This one really embraces the superhero, the 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 metahuman aspect of superpowers in a weekly television format. Whereas Arrow, you know, is more grounded in reality. But mm -hmm. but yeah, you, you don't really have a lot to compare it to live action wise. What there's like Lois and Clark and the '60s Adam West series. There's not a lot of stuff to compare it to, so it's not really all that difficult. But it may be the best true superhero show. Even if I think Arrow may be the better show, The Flash is the better superhero show and may be the best superhero show um, that has ever been on television. And I'll also say this, too. I think we're at a really good place where on television we can do a lot of cool um, visual effects that we couldn't have done five years ago even. Yeah. And, um, I mean, do you remember towards the end of Lost, Hooper, there was a shot, it was in the final season, where you see the island underwater? That shot have, has always stuck out to me as just being incredibly, like, fake looking. Horrible. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like this goofy, like, like uh, shot, like it just, like, pulls back and you see the island underwater. There's, like, these goofy looking CGI sharks that swim by and schools of fish. And it just looks really... It's bad. Janky. It is bad. 
Um, but you know, understandable. I don't fault the show for that. I mean, it was understandable at that time. Um, but I think we're at a really good point now and the flash really kind of keeps pushing the envelope as far as his powers go, because you've got to use, uh, visual effects just to, you know, on him, you know, at the very minimum. But then when you add in other characters like Captain Cold, then you've got a whole nother layer of things you've got to do. Something that sticks out recently is there was an episode where uh, a bomb goes off in the harbor. There's a shot of Barry running away from this tidal wave that, you know, I mean, sure, it's still television, but but it looks really good. And, and it, it doesn't have the laughability that it would have had five years ago on television. Hmm. And um, so I don't know if they're just receiving a larger budget for their visual effects or visual effects have just been pushed that far. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but, um, but yeah, and, and, uh, like I said, the show's got some really great guest stars and some really great adult actors, which, uh, make it feel more mature than a typical CW show where everything is, you know, 20 something year old, attractive people. Um, you've got, you've got some, you know, more mature faces. Uh, Clancy Brown was in an episode. Some uglier people. Um, I, yeah. I mean, to put it. Yes. To some, let me put it this way. Some real looking people, some people that didn't look like they just got done like modeling. Yeah. Yeah. Like they didn't just come from a Hollister shoot. Um, <laughs> and so, so, you know, for that reason, you know, I think the show's uh, a lot more mature than it has any right to be being on the CW. So, so I'm enjoying the flash a lot. Um, I believe, I believe only episode like five, through nine is available on Hulu anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know why they do that, but um, but if you have the ability to check out the first four um, somewhere else, I don't know where you would. Um, I don't know. I guess you could buy them on iTunes um, yeah. or Amazon Prime maybe, but but if you have the, the ability to check the show out, I, I, I highly recommend it, especially if you are a fan of the character or uh, just of superhero stuff in general, because like I said, it's a really fun exploration of uh, superheroes on television. And and, uh, and I will warn you, I've talked a lot about the good. There is some bad. Um, some of the actors are not quite up to snuff, and you'll you'll notice it when they get along someone who is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, when they're by themselves or with another actor who's not all that great, uh, you can kind of buy it a little bit. But you put them against somebody who's tearing up, and then you realize, oh, wait, why are they not tearing up? Oh, because they can't, because they're not that level of actor. But I will say that towards the end of the season, it seems like everybody's settling in a little bit. So maybe that was just a little bit of nerves or a little bit of trying to figure out the characters. Um, so hopefully that's something that'll get better with time. But ov- overall, it's a very good show, and, and it, it it does fall a little bit formulaic at times. But um, But you know what? I can't fault you for formula, I guess. Uh, at least you have one. So, so anyway, that's that's the Flash. Speaking of the CW, you have another show. You know, I do. I have Arrow. Um, I believe it's the eighth episode of each show of their current season, The Flash and Arrow. Uh, there's a crossover. Oh. Um, so it's a two-parter. You have to watch one part on The Flash and one part on Arrow. So because I knew that was coming up, I decided I better go ahead and give Arrow a shot. Even though I had tried to watch the pilot twice already and had never made it through the pilot. (laughs) So I watched the pilot, finally got through it, and realized at the end that some of the things that I'd had a problem with at the beginning were solved by the end. Um, And if I had just kept watching, I probably would have been okay. Arrow really surprised me too. It's another one of those shows that... It seems they're going to sell it on the abs of Stephen Amell um, because they do. I mean, any picture you see from Arrow, it's usually him with his shirt off. Um, so I thought, oh, great. Okay, it's a Hollister ad, basically, the whole show is. But uh, but it really isn't. They've, they've got some um, some adult actors in there that, like I said, li- like I said for Arrow or for Flash, it sort of lends credence and, and matures the show a little bit. What Arrow has going for it is, is a couple of things. First of all, interesting characters with interesting secrets. It's not easy to do interesting secrets. It's very easy to do secrets. Oh, here's a character with a secret, but it's not easy to do an interesting one. It has a tone that it strikes that I think was really, really cool. Arrow is about a spoiled rich kid named Oliver Queen. Um, Oliver Queen is just a jerk and playboy, all that kind of stuff, right? And he goes on a um, cruise um, 
with his father and his girlfriend's sister because he's a jerk. Um, and uh, the ship that they're on, it's, I mean, it's their own ship. It's not like a cruise liner. It's their own ship. They're billionaires. Um, I, I don't know what happens, but it hits something or something. And anyway, the ship goes down. You sort of see from there that Queen, Oliver Queen, washes up on shore of this deserted Chinese island. And over the course of the season, we flash, the first season, we flash back from the island to the mainland. And, and so what happens is, after five years on this island, he comes home. He's finally rescued from the island, and he comes home to Starling City, reunites with his mother and his uh, sister. Um, his father died in the crash, the, the, the you know, boat sinking, whatever. Um, so his mother's been remarried, and so there's some changes that have happened that he's got to get used to. Oliver comes back a, a very different man than the man that was on the boat. He is focused and quiet, really, really kind of burdened by something. And what it turns out that, that that is, is his father was involved in a lot of bad dealings, a lot of gangster activity, a lot of bad stuff in Starling City. And so to atone for his father's sins, his father had given him a list of all the names of people that were poisoning the city. Oliver takes this list and begins to hunt down the rich and the powerful in Starling City, sort of a Robin Hood story. Um, he's he's seeking out the rich and the corrupt in the city and, you know, as the arrow, confronting them and causing them to either go to jail or change their ways. And we keep flashing back to seeing his time on the island and how it has changed him um, from the spoiled rich kid to the super focused, incredibly fit and talented, you know, man that he is now. Um, and so that trend continues into the third season. We're flashing back and forth. The show builds a very natural way. It's not it's not a freak of the week show. It's not really a mystery of the week show like, say, Sherlock is or any CSI kind of thing, although there is an element of that. But there definitely is an overarching story that, that happens each season. So the first season, there's a threat to his city that the Arrow begins to have to solve. The second season, one of the things that he encountered on the island comes back to haunt him. And in the third season, he's haunted by some time that he spent off the island during those initial five years. Because um, he wasn't on the island the entire five years. Um, so there's a lot of interesting secrets happening, and we're flashing back and forth. And anyway, I've spent a good amount of time, I feel like, recapping. But but nevertheless, it's a really cool show. Um what I mean by the tone of it, it's very inspired by the raid, it seems. Um, it's brutal, it's real, and it's intense. Uh, what Oliver Queen does is not just shoot bows and arrows, but also, you know, throat punches and, you know, gut stabbings. And and it's, it's, it's intense. Now, there's, a, there's a, a progression that the show has seen which it remains to be seen whether this is good or bad, um, that now that it crosses over with The Flash, which is a very supernatural, super powery show, the Arrow has had to change the world that it exists in from a very realistic Batman Begins type of world to a superpower Justice League type of world. And I feel like it's doing a pretty good job so far. Um, we're about halfway through the third season now, um, and really it was this third season that where that change was going to happen. So, um, you know, there, it remains to be seen how it'll, you know, end up by the end of this, but where we are right now, um, Oliver is taking on the league of assassins and Ra's al Ghul. So we're taking on a lot of really cool, familiar DC characters and, um, and twisting them in very cool, interesting ways. Long story short, it's a really cool show. It's something that I think is really fun. If not incredibly smart, it is fun has a story worth telling and its actors do a fine job for the most part. Again, like on flash, there are people that you kind of have to suffer through. And there are people who are just, you know, Hollister models. In fact, I think one of them was an Abercrombie model for a very long time. Um, Shocking. I know it's just, it's just mind blowing that that would happen on a CW <laughs> Absolutely show. Absolutely shocking. <laughs> but, um, 
but Brandon Ralph is on the show now, you know, that lends a little bit of credence to it. And, um, yeah, it, it's just interesting. And, and, and they've brought in a lot of superheroes and a lot of villains and a lot of DC comics locations and stuff that, that have ne- has never seen the light of day in terms of live action material before. And, uh, so for that reason alone, the fanboy in me likes it. Um, but the filmmaker in me also enjoys j- the tone that it strikes and the, 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 the way that the story unfolds. It's not uncommon in a post lost TV environment to see, you know, the flashback, right? Flashbacks happen in every show all the time, but lost was really the only one to me up until arrow to do it. Interestingly, you know, cause on lost, you have what's going on on the Island and we'll flash back to something that happened on the mainland that sort of is the same thematically or, you know, is just, similar in some way to what's happening on the island and the same sort of thing is happening on arrow um so they're definitely taking a few cues from lost in a good way not in a oh great they're going to start doing stupid things that are never going to be answered kind of way there again you know it's a really fun show and um apart from a few bad actors and apart from a few uh strange storylines um i think it's 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 really worth your time and uh, like I said, it's on Netflix, so um, you may have to suffer through the first episode, especially if you know anything about the Green Lantern, I mean, sorry, the Green Arrow uh, mythology, you'll start being like, oh, great, they're changing that, they're changing this, they're changing all these stupid things for no apparent reason, but uh, it, it does make sense later, so stick with it. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I've got. Um, the Flash and the Arrow are both worth your time. Um, really, if, if you watch one and enjoy it, I would recommend watching the other because they're in the same kind of, uh, league in terms of, uh, you know, storytelling. So, so if you enjoy one, you'll probably enjoy the other. So, so give them both a shot. I will say this too. It's very interesting to me that there's a flash show and a green arrow show, and there's a show called Gotham. And of the three, the one that I'm not watching is Gotham. Yeah. The one that has the most to do with the character that I love the most, I don't watch. Well, I mean, to to watch a show that, that, that you know, that's associated with Batman, and then the whole time you're like, this would just be so much better if Batman was in it. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It's, it, it's, I did watch the first two episodes, but it's just unbearable. Like, I can't, I cannot even, and I don't think it's one of those things like with Arrow, like, if I gave it another shot, maybe I would like it. I think it's just, I'm never going to like Gotham. It just doesn't even make any sense to me conceptually. In a TV landscape where there's superheroes beating up supervillains, why would I want to watch a show about a city and about a cop who doesn't beat up supervillains because he can't because they don't exist yet? You know what I mean? It just doesn't make any sense to me why 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 I would watch that show. Yeah. When I when I could watch the Flash run circles around Captain Cold, or I could watch Jim Gordon take down you know, Carmine Falcone. Oh wait, not take him down because he can't win in the end because Batman has to be here. I'll also say this too. One last thing: um, Greg Berlanti uh, is the executive producer of both Flash and Arrow, and he's also pitched a new show which will be on CBS, not on CW, called Supergirl. And uh, if it goes to series, it will exist in the same universe as these two shows. So we could have a cross-network crossover uh, between Supergirl, Flash, and Arrow. And I find that concept intriguing. And I think TNT is also – they're working on a pilot for TNT called Teen Titans, um, which would star Dick Grayson as the – as Nightwing, as the leader of the Teen Titans. And the thought, even though Greg Berlanti is not involved, is that uh, DC wants that show to also uh, be able to cross over with Flash and Arrow. So I don't know how it will all work out. Um, It doesn't sound like it will, because on Teen Titans, you would think Kid Flash would be there. And if Kid Flash is there, you'd be like, well, why is Kid Flash not on Flash? Uh, So anyway, I don't know if any of that will work out. But Supergirl is in the process of being made, and it's by Greg Berlanti, so that will be the third uh, in this universe that we'll see. So, But probably not the last. So I um, decided that since uh, Justified is, a, it is currently entering its final season on FX, I thought, hey, this is a great time to start the show in general. I hopped on Amazon, and I've been watching Justified. 
Mm. Uh, and I've finished the whole first season. And um, I thought it was worth talking about. Um, this is a neo-Western <clears throat> starring Timothy Oliphant as a U.S. Marshal. And it takes place in a town called Harlan, Kentucky. And Dustin, I, I'm going to go ahead and recommend this show to you because I think it's right up your alley. Um, mm mm-hmm. This is a show about, you know, he, he's a U.S. Marshal, and in the pilot, he kills a guy. Mm-hmm. And um, everyone's sort of kind of doubting that it wasn't a clean shoot or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But so he, at the time, he's in Miami, and so they send him back to his hometown or whatever to work for the Marshal Service there. And it's, it's, it's an interesting little show. It, it, the first season sort of takes on, especially in the first half, it, it takes on more of a crime of the week kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But so well done. Like, first of all, the mm-hmm. setting just being in Kentucky makes it different from any other like weekly show. So what differentiates it is the setting. Uh, the um, the dialogue is very good, and whoever the antagonist is that week, or whoever's you know hostage holding the whatever, it, all the dialogue is written smartly. Every like little trick and stupid trope that you see in like you know Law and Order, or, I don't know some other show like doesn't mm-hmm. happen cuz everyone's too smart for that kind of thing. Um mm-hmm. it's a funny show. Um and the cinematography is very impressive. Like you would rewatch the show because the shot design is so good that you you want to watch it. Like so every interaction is, you know, like when we sit down we criticize things and we go, "Well, why wouldn't he just do this?" Those kinds of things happen in this show or they don't because mm-hmm. everyone's already thought of it kind of thing. So it's right. it's um it exceeds your expectations of of how a scene develops or how how a confrontation develops. The, the acting's all really good. The story's interesting. The characters are engaging. The cinematography is is well done. Is this show also stars uh, Walton Goggins, who I'm a big fan of, especially from The Shield, and who I think over the course of the series is kind of the main antagonist. Although he's sort of just being established in this first season, but it's a, it's a very good show. I'm really looking forward to the next, uh, I think, three seasons that I'm still got to get through. Anyone who's already watching the show is already knows what I'm talking about and is probably enjoying the final season as we speak. And and I think I heard someone refer to it as the, the most underrated show on television. Like, cause I, I don't hear anybody talk about Justified. I remember when it came mm-hmm. out, this one podcast I was listening to, like, that, that would always always mention it, like, Justified, Justified, Justified. I'd be like, okay, cool, you like Justified. But he's the yeah. only one I've heard talk about it, and I'm thinking, why isn't this show in the spotlight more? It's so good. Anyway, I hi- highly recommend Justified for um, anyone who's a fan of <laughs> good television. That reminds me, my, my uncle actually let me borrow the first season on DVD. It was over a year ago, and I watched the first maybe three or four episodes, and I don't remember why I quit. I honestly, I cannot... As you were sitting here thinking, I remembered the Miami thing, but I don't remember what it was that made me stop. And I don't know if it was just that I just stopped. Yeah, I had the same experience. Like I, I, I'd watched like the first three or four, and for some reason, I, I had stopped. And I'm going through watching mm-hmm. it. Like, why didn't I? And maybe it is that those first <clears throat> three are just kind of like meh, because you're just like oh, and uh, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Maybe maybe right after that it got better. I don't I don't remember. I just yeah. know thinking like this show is. I've been hearing great things about this, and I just, I don't know, I just, for some reason, I gave it another shot, and uh, I don't know what it it is. It actually reminds me that I still have his DVD set. Well, you should finish the season. (laughs) I should. Um, I remember seeing one of the more recent episodes at the um, television festival that SCAD puts on every year. Um, I worked that last year, and we had a justified night. And um, so they showed a couple of the, or maybe just one, of the more recent episodes. And like you said, it looked phenomenal just yeah. in terms of cinematography. Uh, but I tried not to pay attention to the story because I thought at some point I might pick the show back up. So Right. Yeah, it's. I think it, it, it was just the shot design is very deliberate and very well done. Um, sure. And especially you need that in, in, in what's essentially like a modern day Western, you know. And yeah, people yeah, yeah. think like, you know, maybe to like the average viewer, it's like, well, who cares about the shot design? I, you don't realize that like the shot design really does play into whether you like a show or not, because whether you realize it's subliminal, you know, wh- wh- whether yeah, you realize yeah. it or not, a show looking good actually tell is, is part of what tells your brain you like it. You know, if a show right. is not that well shot, that's going to play into you thinking like, oh, I just didn't enjoy watching it. Like why? I don't know. I'm not really sure. Something but about see, it. That's that leads me to a good, a good, 
sort of point with Flash and Arrow is that Flash and Arrow, it's competent, but it's, I wouldn't say, like, beautiful. Yeah. You know, I would never say I'm going to rewatch it because it's just, you know, so gorgeous to look at. Yeah. So, so it definitely does mean something when, when your show is like that. And, you know, that's, our, that's the way Breaking Bad was. And, and to some extent, you know, Lost was that way. It was, yeah. it was a really good looking show in its heyday. Well, that's justified. Um, well, that's good. I also finished a show, speaking of F- FX and speaking of Walton Goggins, we had been watching for several months The Shield. And uh, mm-hmm. obviously, for people who don't know, The Shield was a, uh, a television show on, on FX from like 2002 or something. I don't know, from like seven seasons. It ended in 2008. This was a show starring uh, Michael Chiklis as a Los Angeles strike team leader. Uh, he was corrupt. And his and, and you know his strike team teammates who were also kind of crooked cops in a way, um, and so this show was extremely important in <clears throat> modern day storytelling and character work because this was the show along with The Sopranos that showed people that like uh, your main character didn't have to be a great person to make the show interesting. Like mm. it, it, the, in fact, yeah, yeah. him being a morally conflicted character was more interesting than you know watching you know, a boy scout do good things against bad people all the time. So yeah, yeah. this show was, was the other side of the, of the coin. You know, everyone's oh, the Sopranos ushered in and it was the Sopranos, but it was also the shield, the shield, what the Sopranos was doing with HBO was one thing. And what the shield was able to do on cable was another, you know? Um, and, mm-hmm. and that's really the standard for, for most of the shows you see on cable these days. Now I say the show as a whole, I don't like it as much as Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or, you know, maybe other shows I've seen. And if you're if you haven't already watched it, maybe it's not worth, you know, I mean, it's seven seasons long. And I have to be honest, the first three aren't they're They're just kind of OK. But part of that might be because they don't hold. I don't know if they don't hold up. I'm not sure why they don't hold up. I, I think maybe it's just a hard show to binge watch. Like yeah. it, it might be hard to watch them back to back, just because you know they're 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 a little slower, and I, I don't know. But the where well, the show really gets good is in the fourth season. Glenn Close um, become is a is a character that season. She becomes the mm-hmm. uh, the captain. Mm-hmm. So that's when the show really picks up, and that's kind of the popular opinion about it. Like the show kind of started getting really good when she showed up, and then the season after that, Forrest Whitaker is in it. So it's it's a good uh solid show. Enjoyed seeing it all the way through. I just think it's a little hard to um it's a little hard to to just sort of marathon it. I, sure. it this was before people considered that people would be able to watch these back to back to back to back to back, you know, right. in in quick succession. So that's not factored in to the way they told their story. You know, mm-hmm. so one of the things I guess that doesn't hold up is the pace, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Um, gotcha. But a good show with compelling characters and very serious consequences and very serious situations. And so, of course, I was super into that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, that's that's The Shield. So also in FX um, and also with the involvement of Kurt Sutter, I also finished Sons of Anarchy, mm-hmm. which concluded its uh, series run on FX this past fall. This show was starting up right around the same time that The Shield was ending. I think it premiered during this um Maybe it was right after The Shield finished. And uh, the showrunner's a guy named Kurt Sutter, who was an executive producer on The Shield. So Sons of Anarchy is about a motorcycle club gang, I guess, who are involved in, like, arms dealing for the Irish mob and just kind of, you know, low-level racketeering. They're not nearly as bad as, you know, Tony Soprano or Vic Mackey. Um, The main character, his name is Jax Teller, um, played by Charlie Hunnam. The show is solid. I really don't have that many complaints. I don't know if I'd recommend it. I mean, let me start with the negatives and I'll bring it back around. It's really hard for me, especially to watch a show where the person playing the main character is trying to is is from England and he's putting on an American accent and for 7 years I have to mm-hmm. continually watch him fail at doing so. <laughs> For seven years. It's just like he all, you know, <laughs> he's just he's just like the Irish are coming to get the guns. We have to get them out of here. And then, like, or whenever he had to talk faster, yell, you could just tell, like, God, he's he's not an Amer- he's not a he's not an American, right. yeah, you know. But he's they're supposed to be from like Oakland, you know what I mean? Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you can just it's see right through him. So, right. 
I mean, I love Charlie Hunnam. I just, um, that's the only thing is that really did pull me out of it. It just continually reminded me. Um, it's also another one of those shows. Sam and I talked about this while we were watching The Expendables. It's another one of those shows where everyone growls their lines <laughs> as yeah. much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> because they're these tough biker dudes, and I, I've never seen so much smoking and drinking on a show. <laughs> like, just Sons of Anarchy is, it's one of those shows where, and, and it took me out of it a lot, because I kept thinking, like, and maybe I'm uptight, but I think people who know me personally know I'm really not. I'm really not. Mm. This show is surrounded by, you know, these bad boys with tattoos and motorcycles who are, are surrounded by scantily clad, gross-looking quote unquote hot women with like breast implants. Oh, and, and they're, the, and then they like, they're like owners in like a porn business too. So there's constantly like, you know, those, those kinds of, uh, uh, women's around. And, uh-huh. um, it's just lots of smoking uh, cigarettes, lots of, you know, whiskey shots. And the whole time I'm wondering like, who's paying for all these, by the way, cause I just see all <laughs> poor drinks and walk away. Who does anyone whip out a credit card and just say, Hey, by the way, like I'm buying, I always wondered like, God, the, where, but how do you pay for all this? You know, smoking, drinking, boobies, and every now and then an episode would begin with just like a, like a montage of things happening. And quite often, one of them involved one of the characters having sex with somebody. Like, uh-huh. you know, a whole, and I'll say this, a whole lot of Charlie Hunnam's ass in this show. <laughs> More of his ass than I wanted to see, which, by the way, right. was zero. It was zero percent. Yeah. yeah. And like sometimes, like it'll like the show starts and there's just the, his ass and he's like thrusting into a woman. You're like, whoa, <laughs> whoa! This show is solid, and I give it points for creating a believable world. And I never w- sure. once believed that anything that was happening in the show would not go down the way it did. So I give it points for story believability. Mm-hmm. I I just didn't really buy into the the characters or really latch onto them the way that you would want to and the way that they had sure. intended me to for this kind of show. I didn't really care about Jax or the choices he made because the whole show mm-hmm. is about like how he decides maybe I shouldn't be doing this with my life. And as the show goes along, he becomes the president of the, of the motorcycle club and he ha- has like a family and he's like, do I want my, my sons to grow up in this kind of world where this is how we treat women and this is how we treat black people and this is how we treat, and this is just how we treat people. Like, do I want them to grow mm-hmm. up surrounded by these people? And, yeah. you know, the whole show is about like, can you fight your nature? Can you, Can you go against the way you are like, you know, as, as, you know, someone as someone who is a criminal, can Jax actually be a good man or does Mm -hmm. him trying to be a good man? Is it just inevitable that he'll do bad things? So he's not as bad of a guy as Vic Mackey. You know, he does some bad things, but he's a lot more sympathetic, I think. You know, um, I got to say, Hooper, the way that you talk about Sons of Anarchy yeah. makes me think it's a little more intellectual than my choice of Flash, where the the conflict is, will Barry stop the talking gorilla from robbing the bank? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, may, maybe it is. I mean, there is there are philosophical undertones. I mean, like, it, it's, it's not a bad show. I just think that, I guess I'm not sure. It, and it's got good actors, and it's got... It's got good stuff in it. I just think, especially the first couple of seasons, it's a lot more just of this, you know how I am, like these carefree, like every now and then, like someone throws like a Molotov cocktail at their bicycle shop. So they had this like, you know, like rock and roll, like kind of like chase to get the guy and they're shooting at him, running down the street, weaving through traffic. And I'm like, where are the police? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, just things like that. Where I'm, and then they catch him and it's like, yeah, we got you. And then they interrogate him or whatever and find out who's behind it. And I'm like, this is stupid. Like things like mm-hmm. that are dumb. What I much more appreciated was like the last two seasons where like people are dying and like yeah, yeah. bad things are happening. So mm-hmm. maybe the slow burn helped me appreciate the later seasons or maybe it's just because when shows end, you can do things with more finality. But I guess I sure. felt like there were zero stakes for at least half the show. And gotcha. maybe that's the problem. But in terms of, you know, Jax is likable and that's cool. But um, and, and like I said, things that happen within the story and within the world are very believable and they get a hundred points for that. Um, mm-hmm. I just don't know. I think seven seasons was too long for this show. I feel like it should have mm-hmm. been, it should, it could have been tighter. That's the biggest, comp- sure. and maybe that's the same with the shield. It just could have been tighter. The shield had, had a little less fat to trim than anarchy mm-hmm. does, but, um, well, let me ask you this and, and just tell me if this is, you know, a fair observation or not. 
Um, I've never seen Sons of Anarchy, but I felt like towards the beginning, what little bits I had seen, little bits and pieces, uh, it almost seemed a little bit like, here's this this thing, and it was almost like, we just want the audience to see what life is like for people in a biker gang. And so what, you, what you're saying about there being sort of no stakes and that kind of stuff is because maybe to me the way that it came across was it was always like almost like a show and tell. Like does that make sense? Like it wasn't necessarily trying to tell a story as much as it was just trying to show us something that we hadn't seen. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. I mean, and that's probably one of the reasons it even got picked up was just because, oh, there's never been a show about a biker gang. And yeah, mm-hmm. they're right. But it needs to be a good show about a biker gang. Sure. I'll say this for it, too, because Katie Seagal deserves um, acclaim. Katie Seagal mm-hmm. plays, um, if you don't know who she is, she was way back on Married with Children. She was Peggy Bundy for 11 years um, yeah, yeah. with Ed O'Neill. And she, and, um, she was uh, romantically involved with Locke on Lost. That's true. Yeah, she was uh, Helen, and she's Le- she voices Leela on Futurama. Leela. So, yeah. you know who Katie Seagal is. Um, she mm-hmm. play, and she's also married to the showrunner. So she plays like the matriarch of this this gang. She is the most complex and interesting character on the show, more so than the lead character, which is both a good and a bad thing. But it's good for her because she's this. She does the most questionable things on the show. But she also mm. comes across at times as you, you 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 always just like when she does them you're like what is your problem and then but later you're mm-hmm. you're you're just like but I I get I I get it though like you don't yeah, see yeah. her as like a bad person as much as like a damaged person who doesn't know how to make the right choices right and that's good writing that's good character yeah, work yeah. and it's good acting so yeah. she's probably the best part of the show in my opinion I don't know I just thought that she deserved some recognition so. Uh, so that's Sons of Anarchy. Um, yeah, so The Shield and Sons of Anarchy are two two solid shows. Yeah. It's not imperative if you watch them right now. Sure. Um, if you missed them, don't worry about it. If you were if you stopped in the middle, go ahead and finish them. You know, they end mm-hmm. in satisfying ways. Okay, and the last thing I got um, is a little bit quicker is another show that finished its run is The, uh, the Newsroom on HBO. Mm-hmm. This show had three seasons. I could have done with a fourth, to be honest. I thought three was a little quick, but um, mm-hmm. but it didn't overstay its welcome. So maybe it's maybe it's better. I don't know. So I feel like th- I feel like three is a little short. Three's short for any show. I think four yeah. is right around where it's like, all right, this is okay. I think five. I think we decide with Breaking Bad. Five is the golden number mm-hmm. of uh, seasons for a show. Six was too much for Lost. I think everyone agreed. I'm I've just mm-hmm. stated I think that seven's too long for uh, most dramas. Um. Mm-hmm. So whatever. Um, I mean, what, what do you mean? Do you think so? Yeah, I, I feel like the magic number is is a little bit different for every show, but yeah. but typically, typically for me, any more than five seasons, and you're going to have to really explain to me why it's imperative that there's more than five seasons. How, why uh, ha, how, why have the characters survived this many deadly encounters or whatever? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's if it's more than five seasons. There better be a darn good reason for yeah. it, um, because I don't. The thing with TV for me is is I like to feel as a viewer that the that the showrunner that the writers have an ending in mind that they have a goal that they're trying to get to, and for some reason maybe five is the number where like if we're in season six or in seven I start to I start to really really you know what in five I start to wonder where we're headed. Yeah. Um, before that, I can kind of let things go. But in five, I start saying, okay, you guys have had five years. I assume you know what you're doing. And if there's no end in sight, then that doesn't seem like a good sign to me. Um, and I don't know, again, if that was just because I've been burned by other shows in the past or what it is, but but five to me is, is sort, of the, sort of the default. But I do think that it's different from show to show. Um, there's no reason for something like Smallville to have ten years. There's no reason for something like Star Trek to only have three, you know, um, or for Firefly to have fourteen episodes. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, I think I think generally five is about the magic number. I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, the newsroom. Here's the thing about the newsroom. I'm going to include my opinion and popular opinion. Um, Okay. Here's here's how I sum up the show in in one sentence or in three short ones. Mm-hmm. Um, the first season was very up its own ass. Um, mm-hmm. The second season actually had a plot. 
Mm-hmm. And season three actually had a heart. Mm. That's my succinct, you know, quick summary of the show. Um, this show is um, written and show run and created by Aaron Sorkin. Mm-hmm. So anyone who knows Aaron Sorkin knows that he writes this overlapping, um, you know, quick, pithy, witty dialogue. But mm-hmm. people think, oh, like Joss Whedon. No, not like Joss Whedon. Um, right. Joss Whedon does not load his characters with encyclopedic knowledge of whatever topic they're speaking about. Aaron yeah. Sorkin will load people up with, with, with more quick facts than you see in like criminal minds. You know, yeah, it's yeah. just like, he'll lo- you know, they'll just be talking about blah, 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 blah. Like n- no one, no one sits there and goes, I actually don't know anything about this subject. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. just, you know, yeah. <laughs> so the show obviously revolves around a news organization, uh, American, um, ACN American Cable News, and uh, it's ma- it's it's a it's a cable news show. Uh, Jeff Daniel stars as Will McAvoy, and he's the anchor. He's the he's the anchor of the show, and it's a uh, it's kind of like a CNN ish or HLN, you know. Like it's it's kind of like it's essentially what if you know Jeff Daniels had a one hour news show on CNN. It's it's where you yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 factual, but it's it's basically run by his opinions or his spin on it. It kind of like, like the O'Reilly mm-hmm. the O'Reilly factor or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's essentially about reinvigorating these people's um, spirit in 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 just doing the news, like the passion behind mm-hmm. doing the news. Um, so I, I work in the news, so it's interesting to me in, in that way because it's familiar, but it's also I don't know, kind of endearing in a way to see people who who just want to do who to see people who see news as it used to be seen by everyone in the business, which is um, as a public service. You know, before it became commercialized and before it became about ratings and and what mm-hmm. the people wanted to see. Um, but the first season's got really none of that. Um, this is a show that usually that takes place like two years behind whatever year you're watching it in. So like mm-hmm. the first season, like the you don't even realize till halfway through the episode or whenever that. Um, and this show premiered in like 2012, I think. So the first thing that happens in the pilot is the BP oil spill. And so you're like, wait, that was a couple of years. And you realize through the course of the season, you're like, oh, well, I don't – what I don't like about the first season is that it sets itself two years behind. And I feel like it's a chicken shit move because then you're like, oh, I, I control – but I also get it because you are controlling – you know what events are going to occur within the season and you can bend your story around it. And you can either put them on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. But since you know how this story unfolded and concluded, you know all the facts in front of you. You can make them make definitive choices and us to go, that's the right choice because then later this would happen. And what, you know what I mean? Like you're, you have like yeah. a crystal ball. And I didn't like mm. that because I was like, that's, that's kind of like a eh, move. But it was still interesting to watch in terms of just yeah. the way it was shot um, and, and the character interactions and the acting was really good. Um, season mm-hmm. two, they actually decided, okay, we're going to have this overrunning arc where they're working on a gigantic investigative report about this um, that's, that's based on an actual like U.S. operation but isn't that U.S. operation. And so I thought, mm-hmm. I'm impressed that they're not trying to be the first – cable network that you know exposed the this about the united states army they're instead picking a fictional yeah. event that they created for the show and i thought that's yeah that's fine i like that that's good and then the third season was really yeah, more yeah. about the I'm, I'm gonna add something in here because this really dovetails nicely i also recently saw anchorman 2 which i mm-hmm. didn't really you know it was kind of funny whatever it had its moments um that movie, by the way, is mostly full of, hey, remember this from the first movie? Ah, mm-hmm. You know, and it's just no. like, yeah. ah, I didn't like it. I didn't um, care for it. But here's what's good about it. The subtext about what constitutes news yep. is good. Yep. And so I give it points for actually having something to say. So I saw Anchorman 2 and the final season of this show around the same time. And I thought it was interesting that they each had something to say, and it was the same thing, which is basically like people don't want to hear about this thing or this thing or this thing. They want to hear about who's getting pregnant, and you know, um, mm-hmm. and and we want Twitter followers, and we want this and this and this, and the site is going to be this, and we're going to follow these people. And it's just like this isn't news, and you know, yep. and this, obviously the higher ups in the company who grew up, you know, around like Ed Murrow are like, no, this is not what we're supposed to be doing. It's nice to see 
them actually have a heart to round out the show where it started as just this kind of soapbox. And then three is kind of more like it comes from a really earnest and personal place. And while yeah. it does take a very safe stance on modern day news, which is, you know, the, the one that everyone kind of agrees with. Yeah. Everyone agrees with it because that's how the, the mass true. population thinks of news. It's, it's why do we have 24 hour news? Why are we rotating the same story? Why are we, this and that, and why are we making more out of this issue than it actually is? And it's all mm. about ratings. And yep. I just thought it was interesting that that a show. I mean, maybe it's not that interesting. We live in America; we can say whatever the fuck we want. It may, so <laughs> maybe it's not that interesting. But I, I like that, you know, that that's what it had to say, and that that's how it chose to finish out the show. I just, I don't know. So I think the newsroom is overall worth it because one, it's short; it's not going to take up much of your time. I mean, the sixth, the the third, the third season is six episodes. Really? Yeah, the first two seasons are like maybe like twelve or thirteen, but I mean that's, you know, that's like thirty. That's thirty episodes and change for an entire show, that I think is well shot, uh, well written, and uh, well acted, and did not overstay its welcome. So I think of the three of the shows I mentioned today, I would recommend the newsroom the most, just in terms of um, what I expected from it, and how much time I invested when I got out of it. Yeah, you yeah. know, the show matured in a very short amount of time. So, yeah. So so how many episodes are there overall of the show? Um, there's 10 the first season. There's 10 the first season. I guess there's 13 or 12 the second season. I mean, okay. it's... Yeah, that's totally doable. Yeah. So that's a good show. So if you have uh, mm-hmm. HBO, or HBO Go, or, um, you know, I'm sure they're available to rent pretty soon or, uh, or get, you know, from mm-hmm. the library or whatever... Or, or just buy it. I'm sure the box set's not even that. I mean, I I think it's. I don't know. And I, I, I don't and know. A lot HBO of people charges like crazy for their box sets. In this show, for whatever reason, recently the the a scene from the pilot's been floating around the internet lately, for, which is kind of weird because people have been posting. There's a scene in the pilot. The the pilot opens with um, Jeff Daniels at like a like a college Q and A, and there's hmm. there's a liberal pundit to his left, and there's a conservative one to his right, or whatever. Or uh, I didn't pick left and right intentionally. It could be the opposite. Um, <laughs> but in fact, I think she's on his right. Um, but um, he's asked by someone. They're all asked by this girl in the audience. Why? Why is America the greatest country in the world or whatever? So the liberal mm-hmm. ones like um, equality and uh, some other horse shit. Um, and the conservative ones like freedom and freedom. And um he, they ask him, and he's like, I don't have an answer. And so Will McAvoy is one of the more interesting characters on television because he's incredibly smart, um, mm-hmm. but he is he is he has absolutely zero ounce of bullshit in him. And yeah. that's what's most likable about him. He's, he's a straight shooter. He's cynical, um, but he's very factually, you know, he's he's very educated, but he's very real. And mm-hmm. so I like watching the show because I enjoy watching him either – you know, build people up or tell people you're full of shit because blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Um, anyway, it's, it, it, but anyway, his answer when they finally get it out of him is it's not the greatest country in the world. And here's why. And he lists all this stuff and he just, he just, he just destroys the room, but then he ends it with a real, like honest, like we used to be though. And we used to believe in things and it can be the greatest country again. Personally, I don't know that I don't believe that America is the greatest country in the world. Um, mm-hmm. I understand that that sounds elitist, but I I, en- I enjoyed his speech and I enjoyed you know the point of view wasn't stupid. So yeah. Anyway, like I said, I've, I've been rattling on about the show, but it's I think it's because I you know I, I liked it, I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed him as a lead character. And it's unfortunate that this season premiered like the same weekend as Dumb and Dumber Two. Uh-huh. Jeff Daniels is a I think an incredibly undervalued dramatic actor. Um, oh yeah. And it's not easy to act Sorkin dialogue yeah, yeah. without it being incredibly expository. So, yeah. and I guess a quick shout out to Olivia Munn, who's in this, who's in this show too, who does a really good job as well. Um, all right. Well, I guess that's it. You guys uh, stay tuned for other episodes in the future. I don't know what we're going to talk about yeah. yet. Yeah.